All right. Um, I'm a tough guy. Um, those of you who are speaking, if you don't finish at the 11 to 12 minute mark, I'm coming right up to you and knocking you off the lectern. So, um, yeah. So, uh, uh, one of the topics that I think uh, is sort of gaining a lot of interest, um, and that's the general topic of phase behavior inside cells. So, we'll start off with phase separation in the context of membrane-less organelles, and Richard Krivaki from St. Jude will start. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I'll, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you today about our work, uh, which centers on the role of phase separation uh, in biology and disease. And in, in through conversations uh, at the conference already, I realized that it, many of you are not really... A, familiar with this concept of phase separation and how it mediates compartmentalization of, of the cell. I'm sure many of you are. Um, but so, so these objects in the background of this slide are nucleoli, which are multi-layered structures with each layer forming through the process of liquid-liquid of phase separation. So today, I'd like to give you some insight into um, how this works its relevance to the biology that occurs within the nucleolus and the intersection of nucleolar biology with uh, ALS disease mechanisms. Uh, so I'll talk about three topics, the role of the protein nucleophosmin, or NPM1, as a nucleolar organizer through phase separation how arginine-rich dipeptide repeats disturb the nucleolus in ALS. And I'll close with some comments about the broad relevance of biomolecular condensates, structures that form through phase separation in ALS and, and uh, also more broadly in neurodegenerative disease in general. A uh, quick shout out to the group. Don't have time to identify individuals. Thanks to funding agencies for support and collaborators for engaging uh, together with us in our science. So Rohit showed this uh, quite iconic uh, slide now uh, yesterday, introducing the idea that there are many different uh, membraneless bodies in cells uh, that compartmentalize biomolecules that function or that form through the process of liquid liquid phase separation. The largest of these is the nucleolar, is the nuclear structure of the nucleolus, which is formed through liquid-liquid phase separation of uh, the genes that encode ribosomal RNAs, the RNA, ribosomal RNAs themselves, and ribosomal proteins, as well as other non-ribosomal nucleolar proteins that assist the process of ribosome uh, biogenesis. Yeah. So the nucleolus functions in uh, ribosome biogenesis and cellular stress uh, signaling. And the components exhibit multivalence for weak transient interactions, the importance of which Rohit emphasized yesterday in forming uh, percolated networks that underlie the process of liquid-liquid uh, phase separation. So I'm first going to talk about the role of nucleophosmin as an organizer of the nucleolus which it does through phase separation with ribosomal proteins as well as ribosomal RNA. So nucleophosmin is the major constituent of the outer region of the nucleolus, which is called the granular component, uh, where it mediates the assembly of pre-ribosomal particles. Uh, so shown on the left is, a, is an image of uh, a, a nucleolus from early work by Cliff Branglin establishing the role of phase separation in the structure and dynamics of the nucleolus. And you can see that there are uh, three different regions, the fibrillar, and shown schematically in the middle, uh, the fibrillar centers are at the very center of the nucleolus, and this is where the, the genes for, I think they'd like me to stay muted. Uh, I don't, there we go. Is that better? Okay, sorry about that. 
Um, okay, so at the very center are the fibrillar centers, and this is where the genes that encode the ribosomal RNAs are clustered. These genes are transcribed by RNA pole 1, and they move into then the second layer, the dense fibrillar component, which is rich in the proteins fibrillarin and nucleolin, which drive, uh, okay, I think we fixed it, uh, which drive phase separation with these preribosomal RNAs. These preribosomal RNAs are processed in the DFC, meaning they're spliced and modified to the mature forms. And due to constant transcription, then there's a flux of these mature molecules outwards. So when they reach, uh, when they exit the DFC, they interact with the nucleophosmin protein, undergo phase separation, and uh, form the granular component. Now, at the same time, ribosomal proteins are being translated in the cytosol, come through the nuclear pores, and then enter the nucleolus through interactions uh, with uh, nucleophosmin uh, that drive uh, phase separation. So in this granular component region of the nucleolus, uh, nucleophosmin phase separates with both ribosomal proteins and ribosomal RNAs, enabling them to assemble into ribosomal subunits. And the links between phase separation and nuclear structure and function have been established over a period of years through work in my lab, Cliff Brangwin's lab, some of which has involved collaboration with Rohit. So basically, what role does nucleophosmin play in the nucleolus? I've said it over and over now. What does it look like? So this is what it looks like. So this is what happens when nucleophosmin is mixed with a single ribosomal protein. Uh, phase separates into these liquid-like droplets or condensates that you can see constantly grow in size, and when they touch each other, they fuse. So this is, this is indicative of uh, the rapid dynamics of molecules within these condensates. Uh, they, these condensates are quite dense with low, high micromolar or low millimolar concentrations of components, and they're quite viscous. And this is an example of emergent behavior where two proteins that, when separate, are dispersed in solution uh, form uh, a mesoscale structure, uh, which then takes on uh, new properties and functions. How does nucleophosmin do this? It does it by being a highly multivalent protein. Uh, this starts at the N-terminus, which is a folded pentamerization domain with the structure shown here. So this then creates multivalence of the other domains in the protein. At the C-terminus is a DNA and RNA binding domain that mediates interactions, especially with ribosomal RNA, but of course there are five copies of it in the pentameric structure. And then connecting the two folded domains is an intrinsically disordered region. Uh, so we heard from Rohit yesterday about the importance of intrinsically disordered regions in proteins and multivalent features within them in the process of phase separation. So this IDR is an, a, an example of such a an IDR because it has multivalence for uh, acidic res residues, which are clustered into two long tracks. So these arginine-rich, uh, these acidic tracks then interact with clusters of arginine residues in other proteins um, that we refer to as arginine-rich motifs to mediate weak transient interactions that underlie the process of phase separation. So how are, these, how are these multivalent features of nucleophosmin manifested in the realm of phase separation? So they're manifested in nucleophosmin being able to phase separate through three independent mechanisms relevant to nucleolar biology. One is it forms, it phase separates and forms condensates with uh, ribosomal RNA and a representation of the networks underlying this are shown, is shown here. Uh, it independently, through interactions of its acidic tracts, phase separates with ribosomal proteins and non-ribosomal proteins that have multiple arginine-rich motifs. And so here's the, here are the condensates. 
Here's the uh, scheme of the underlying uh, network. And it, additionally, nucleophosmin, under the crowded conditions of the cell, can phase separate with itself uh, homotypically uh, through interactions between acidic and basic residues within its IDR. So how do these three mechanisms of phase separation contribute to the assembly of ribosomes in the nucleolus? So the scheme that we've developed to explain this is shown here. Uh, so at the top is a, is a small schematic uh, nucleolus with the granular component region in beige and being expanded below. So the ribosomal RNAs are made in the center or in the second layer or, or processed and emerge from the second layer of the nucleolus into this granular component. So they instantaneously phase separate with nucleophosmin, shown schematically at the top here. Uh, but ribosomal proteins are moving into the nucleolus from the opposite direction, having come from the cytosol into the nucleoplasm. And these also phase separate with nucleophosmin. And if you remember the liquidy nature of those in vitro condensates I showed earlier, that's a reflection of the environment of this granular component region of the nucleolus. So the ribosomal proteins and the ribosomal RNAs moving in opposite directions can encounter each other in somewhere in the interior of this region. And due to th the thermodynamic preferences for ribosomal components interacting with each other rather than nucleophosmin, there's a, there's a thermod thermodynamically downhill flux of ribosomal components assembling into ribosomal subunits. So that's shown here. And what happens when subunits assemble is they bury their interaction sites for uh, nucleophosmin and lose affinity for nucleophosmin, allowing them to passively diffuse out of uh, the nucleolus. So this is a, a sort of a, a scheme uh, based on data that shows how phase separation enables ribosomal components to assemble in the fluid nucleolus into ribosomal subunits. So what's the relevance of this uh, picture to ALS? So <clears throat> ALS, as I'm sure all of you know, is, involves the loss of motor neurons. One form of ALS uh, arises from hexanucleotide repeat expansion in the gene C9 ORF72. And one thing, one thing that occurs because of these, these expansions is uh, dipeptide repeats are translated. Um, there are five different sequences that are translated, but it's been shown uh, by my colleague Paul Taylor and others that two of these are exquisitely uh, toxic, those that uh, have the sequence GR and PR. And we showed together with Paul some years ago that the two toxic DPRs infiltrate the nucleolus because of their arginine content. They bind to nucleophosmin and disturb ribosome biogenesis. Uh, and this was shown to be a, a contributing factor for, associated with the toxicity of these DPRs in cells. Uh, so we wanted to know what the effects of toxic DPRs are on phase separation by nucleophosmin. So we studied PR repeats, and the data I'll show next are for PR23. So this is, uh, this is a video showing the effects of the addition of a, an aliquot of this PR23 peptide to pre-existing condensates composed of the nucleolar protein SURF6 and nucleophosmin. So this will loop. Um, so at, at first, so the, the SURF6 nucleophosmin condensates are sort of a surrogate for the granular component of the nucleolus. And add as, uh, so when the PR peptide is added, it first infiltrates the existing condensates, causes them to, to gain fluidity and start to fuse more rapidly uh, but then ultimately they vacuolate and uh, dissolve. Um, and that's because the DPRs essentially saturate the acidic tracts and nucleophosmin 
that are required to sustain the phase separated state with SURF 6. Um, so this is, this is an illustration of how uh, a toxic PR species um, can alter, dramatically alter, the phase behavior of nucleophosmin condensates. Okay, so just to illustrate what you were watching in terms of a simple phase diagram, so we have nucleophosmin concentration on the y-axis and DPR concentration on the x. And so NPM concentration is fixed, so as we titrate the DPR, initially at a low concentration it doesn't do anything, but then uh, at higher concentrations it enters into this, this two-phase regime where you have a dense phase and a light phase, uh, but then at a certain point uh, it uh, saturates the acidic tracts in nucleophosmin and, and causes reentrance behavior, which is the dissolution of the condensates. Uh, so our hypothesis based on the, these in vitro findings was that by binding nucleophosmin, toxic DPR peptides alter the fluid properties of the GC region of the nucleolus to the extreme of possibly causing its dissolution. Uh, so <clears throat> together with uh, Paul, so my, my postdoc Michael White and Paul's postdoc Pepe Zhang did the the experiments that I'm illustrating here. So we, uh, we imaged cells uh, before and after the addition of PR23. We uh, used aminofluorescence to visualize nucleophosmin, DAPI to visualize DNA, and on the right is the merge of the, of the and, and the, the P DPR is fluorescently labeled. Uh, so upon addition of, of 10 micromolar and 20 micromolar DPR, we see it entering uh, the nucleolus and we see the, uh, basically the, the, the uh, loss of nucleophosmin from the granular component region. The DPR remains within the nucleolus because it's binding to ribosomal RNA and entrapping it within nucleoli. Um, I'll go quickly through this uh, just to say that the Effects of DPRs on nucleoli are DPR length dependent, so this is basically a multivalence scale, and as the DPRs become uh, longer and longer, they phase separate in vitro much more readily with nucleophosmin, always exhibiting reentrant behavior, and that uh, toxicity scales uh, with DPR length, with uh, almost all cells fully killed off um, after 24 hours with the longest uh, 60 repeat uh, peptide. Okay, so toxicity arises when nucleolar phase behavior is altered. Uh, so DPRs disrupt ribosome biogenesis in cells by disturbing the phase behavior of the nucleolus. Um, so how do, the, how do the DPRs affect the dynamic structure of, the nucleo of nucleophosmin? Uh, so we used NMR and, and small angle neutron scattering uh, to monitor the effects of uh, DPRs on nucleophosmin structure. So, so here's a scheme of its pentameric structure. It's a highly dynamic structure because of the IDRs connecting the two folded domains. And when the DPRs bind and at the point where droplets dissolve, uh, so where reentrant behavior occurs, uh, our data showed that the acidic tracts uh, of nucleophosmin are basically bundled together into a conical um, structure um, as schematically illustrated here. And we think this reflects the state of nucleophosmin after uh, it has exited the nucleoli at the higher concentrations of the DPRs. Um, okay, so DPRs exert their toxic uh, toxicity to cells at least in part by altering the phase behavior of the nucleolus. And it, it turns out that this, this, this paradigm, if you'll call it that, uh, is relevant to other uh, forms of uh, ALS driven by other uh, genetic mechanisms. So this is, a, this is an, a figure from a very nice review paper, quite recent, very, very recent, by Paul Taylor and a coworker. Um, so they, they, sh they they document in this review paper that other disease mechanisms impact the phase behavior and dynamism, to use one of Paul's words, uh, of other RNA protein granules, including stress granules. And I won't 
uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through these different examples where mutations in ALS-associated proteins alter the phase behavior of biomolecular condensates, but there, there, are, there are, including the DPRs, at least four such examples, making establishing connections between uh, phase separation and ALS disease pathogenesis. Uh, so to close, then, uh, the multivalence of nucleophosmin enables multiple modes of phase separation. These features enable handoffs that mediate ribosome assembly within the nucleolus. Uh, NPM is vulnerable to the effects of DPRs, and uh, these, uh, the concept that um, ALS, uh, so the key take home is that ALS uh, pathogenesis needs to be viewed through the lens of phase separation. And there, there are, there's data in the literature from, from five years or more showing that this applies to other uh, types of neurodegenerative diseases. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. So we have time for one question. Krastan put his hand up, so if you can. So I don't, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say something. I think that uh, the early works, uh, they, it's just a comment. It's nothing about your talk. Uh, the early work misunderstood actually what's happening in the system. <coughs> Excuse me. So there is the liquid, which is the solvent, which is certainly a liquid. The free protein is most like a gas, mostly very weakly interacting gas. And what happens in the granules is that you get a gas liquid transition. Uh, and this was actually, uh, I, I had long discussions with Cliff, and finally he wrote in one of his appendices, finally, that there are three components. And it's not a liquid liquid, it's a gas liquid transition. And the second thing that I think was misunderstood is that you need multivalency. These kind of transitions are known, and you can take a simple Leonard-Jones potential and get those transitions. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, condensation is known in physics for ages. Um, what in this system is interesting about this multivalency are different is the, what you were describing, the reversibility of these things. In the other diseases that we talked, this is more like a solid. The aggregates are more like solid. They're not dissolvable like a liquid drop will be. And I think that, uh, that I, this is just as a physicist, I had to make this comment because it's just, uh, I think it's propagating the biology community without understanding that these phase transitions have been studied for 60, 70, 80 years. Great, thank you uh, for that comment. So I, I, I think there's a lot to disagree with that comment. So um, respectfully, but we will have a discussion session uh, and I think we should prosecute this. Um, Richard, thank you so much in the interest of staying on time.